introduction of uh, the artist soul. I have with me my good friend and one of Chennai's most well-known people here, Sri Kumar Verma. Uh, before I get on to introduce uh, Sri, I must uh, thank everyone of you who is here to uh, have helped us start on time. One of the things we always pride ourselves with is uh, starting and finishing on time. So this program will last 90 minutes and will uh, close at uh, 8.29, 8.30. You can time it for that. And my name is Avis Vishwanathan. I see a lot of new people here, so I will introduce myself. And uh, I'm blessed to be curating this series, The Artist's Soul. But let's first tell you about a Wandering Artist, this beautiful space that's come up here in our apron. And uh, uh, it will be only appropriate to tell you why the art wandering artist is here in the first place. Uh, I'll do it my way, Sri Ram. Please. Right? <laughs> so, uh, to me, wandering artist is the most happening place in Chennai. Uh, this is where artists come to express themselves. This is where seekers come to uh, kind of immerse themselves. Uh, this is where practitioners come and this is where experimenters come. And uh, this is across all forms of art. And uh, there are continuous programs that are happening here all the time. It's a, it's a three month old facility. And uh, if you've not looked around and if you've not checked the calendar out, please do that. Uh, we have with us here today our hosts, which is uh, uh, Kaveri Punapa, uh, an artist, Poona, sorry, Kaveri Poona, uh, an artist in her own right, and also the founder of the uh, a uh, wandering artist, and Shira Meyer, my young, dynamic friend, uh, who runs Nalanda Way and also is a co-founder at uh, Wandering Artist. So thank you, uh, Kaveri and Shriram. Can we give them a big round of applause for getting us um, going with, uh, with these kind of exciting programs here at Chennai. Uh, why don't we do the artist's soul? What's the artist's soul all about? So the artist's soul is really about people like uh, uh, Shri here, uh, people like Ram there. Ram was my guest in February. Uh, we had Riku and I Ram in January, and we had the Dhananjans last month in March. Uh, we're going to have Keshav, the famous artist and cartoonist, in, in May. Uh, so we're really talking to artists here about their lived experiences. Uh, what, what have their life journeys been like, and what can we learn from them uh, about our own lives, what we can do with uh, some nuggets of perspective and wisdom with them. That's really what the artist soul tries to do. And these are reflective conversations. So the way it's structured is for about uh, 50, 55 minutes, uh, I'll be in conversation with uh, Sri, and then we'll come to you, to the audience, for uh, your questions and your interactions, and we'll close at 8.30. Now, why do I do the artist soul? Uh, and I cannot say I without including Vani, so it will be a we now. So uh, why do we do the artist soul? Vani is my wife, uh, my friend, my soulmate, and for both of us, the artist soul and a few other events that we curate across the city every month is a way of expressing ourselves. Uh, and we find it very, very meaningful to be doing this at a time when we are personally going through uh, a very, very difficult phase in our life. We're going through a bankruptcy. We, we're surviving one, actually, each day. And so if you want to know more about it, uh, please do look me up on Google. Uh, you will find that uh, there is a website, aviswishwanathan.in, and there's a blog that I write daily, uh, aviswishwanathan.wordpress.com. And there is also my book, Fall Like a Rose Petal. So that will tell you why we do programs like this, but the summary is that to us, a higher purpose in life, what we wake up every morning to do, is to inspire people to be happy, despite their circumstances. I think people uh, always, <coughs> most of us, uh, and I was like that for the longest time, we tend to postpone happiness. We, we make it conditional and we say, if I have this, then I will be happy. And so we, uh, through this catharsis, uh, of about 10 years now, we discovered that it is possible to be happy despite the circumstances. And that's why our high purpose is uh, inspiring happiness. And that 
It's why we curate these interesting events. And the one relating to artists is, um, you know, for me, a great opportunity to uh, sit at literally at the feet of great people, uh, friends like Sri, uh, performers, artists who have seen life and share notes with them on what they see the whole journey of life to be. So on that note, having introduced Wandering Artist and the artist's uh, soul, uh, let me welcome you, Sri. Thank you for joining us this evening. How are you feeling? Thank you. This, uh, can I just speak into the mic? Can you hear it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, uh, many years ago there was a movie, a jail movie called Sangir Muragu, and there was a song in that, on the Nari Peer Kulandri. He was Swani, Kaviri, Sri Ram, and Anja was the person, Virod. Thank you so much. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. So half your job is done. I am happy. <laughs> because I am a wandering artist, even while I'm sitting still. <laughs> and I'm the only one who can show you the soul of the artist. <laughs> She's sitting there. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, thanks Geeta for joining us. And there's Geeta also. I, I invited Geeta to sit in the front row, but she somehow wanted to be uh, quietly tucked away somewhere at the back. Did you miss her? She's there, I know she's there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let me uh, also take this uh, opportunity to, uh, I, I won't do a formal, formal introduction of, of Sri, but I'll tell you how I met Sri. Uh, I didn't, of course, uh, there are a few people that would not know Sri Kumar uh, I, I was not among them. I knew him, I knew of him, and uh, uh, I had never met him. Uh, and then, Sometime uh, in 2014, um, I remember a friend, a common friend of ours, Shashi Nair, uh, threw, uh, threw a party at Sri Kumar Verma's place. That's very interesting, right? When you can throw a party at somebody else's place. <laughs> but Shashi is capable of all those things. So it was a get together, more than a party, it was a lunch uh, for everyone to, in the, in the writing, uh, you know, publishing space, journalists all of us to get together. It was a loose confederation of people. There was, there was no body uh, or a club or association, but it was just a bunch of people getting together. And we visited Gita and Sri, and that's the first time I met Sri. I had a keen interest to meet Sri. One was because, you know, how often in life do you connect with some, somebody who's royalty, right? Uh, who's, uh, who's connected with the Trialco royal family. So uh, having lived in Kerala, studied in Kerala, uh, worked in Kerala, I, uh, I had this desire to meet uh, somebody who uh, is a descendant from the Triangle Royal family. And that happened. You were going to say descendant from something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other was uh, for, for all the writing that he does. Uh, so uh, that moment came along. And then, uh, I, you know, uh, as a matter of um, uh, you know, keeping in touch, uh, we were in touch, and I sent him an invite for the launch of my book, Fall Like a Rose Petal, in, in uh, August of uh, 2014, and I least expected him and Geeta to come. And that's when I saw that the, the, the man sitting next to me is, is fundamentally, I mean, I think royalty, writer, all that is, is, comes later now, fundamentally an extremely warm, and a very, very down-to-earth person, a wonderful human being. So to me, Sri Kumar Varma is a wonderful human being. And when I called him I, and in February and told him that, Sri, let's uh, uh, you know, talk to each other, have this conversation uh, at the artist's soul, and I introduced the artist's soul to him, and he accepted the, the invitation. Um, it was over the phone. Uh, I, I didn't have to you know, set up a time to meet him, so he was accessible and I, I was able to speak to him over the phone and, and finalize the, uh, con the, the, the date for today. And I went away to Mysore on, uh, uh, you know, on a family trip, we had a wedding in the family. And while at Mysore, we visited R.K. Narayan's house. And it's a beautiful place, if you ever go to Mysore, you should go there because you can feel the, uh, feel the man's presence there. And 
right up there on, on the wall was a little in, inscription. I mean, it was like a quote pasted on the wall. And it said that you become a writer by writing. It is a yoga. And I, to, to me, when, that, when I read that, I had just spoken to Sri about, uh, about three days before that. And we had finalized on April 8th. And the name that struck me then was not Arkinarayan. Good, these, these are Arkinarayan's words. But the name that struck me was Sri Kumar Varma. So he's a man who's having the, the most, you know, to, to, my, to me, the, the uh, almost 40 years now, Sri, right? Yeah? Uh, of, of writing. And, he, and, to, and to him, I, I believe, and that's what we're going to explore today, it must be a kind of a yoga for you to, to be able to express yourself with the written word the way you do. And interestingly, in 2015, he won the Arkana Prize for uh, excellence in uh, English writing. So, uh, and Arkana I, I read from today's paper that is, is one of your favorite authors, right? So it's come a full circle, right? Uh, just to help you understand, uh, his, his, his body of work covers novels, children's books, poetry, uh, plays, he's a playwright, and he writes columns, and he uh, appears in his work appears in about 15 anthologies. Right? About 15 anthologies. I counted it on your website. So, <laughs> so uh, that's a lot of writing that, that he does. And uh, he was also a, uh, uh, you know, a writer in residence at the Stirling uh, University in UK. Uh, last um, in 2004, right? So that's Sri Kumar Verma for you, ladies and gentlemen. Give him a big hand and welcome. Him. <laughs> so, and apart from all this, of course, I'll, I'll start with the, the 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 point that always drew me to Sri, apart from his writing, which is royalty. So uh, I want to, you know, I know you. He's very uncomfortable about. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, or being addressed to as a person who's a descendant of a royal clan, uh, a heritage, the one that he has. He's very uncomfortable with that. I'll tell you, I'll give you an instance. Um, you know, the, the, the invitation for today's program was originally, the words on it were writer Raja. And it sounded like a Kamala Hassan movie, something <laughs> Basul Raja. <laughs> So he shot it down and he said, no, I'm very uncomfortable with that, you know, I have nothing to do with the, uh, with, 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 with where I was born, you know, I, uh, you know, I am very proud of my lineage, but I'm not really, uh, you know, comfortable with uh, references to it in that sense. And I was actually punning on writer Raja mainly because here's the king of words and that's what I was, we were trying to do, but he shot it down. So. Uh, my first question to you, Sri, is how how was it? So this is more to kind of you know I'm sure this question is there in the minds of everyone here. How was it to grow up in in a family such as yours? Uh, what kind of culture uh, was was prevalent in the in the family that nurtured you and you know helped you grow up? Uh, so I, you know some early thoughts about about the life in. In a, in a palace or in a royal family, how does it work? Um, welcome, Harry. The palace, I was uh, about uh, three or four years uh, when we left the palace and I was, uh, we, we came to Madras. And here it was a completely different body came altogether because my uh, father, uh, who is the president of the Kerala Samadhi for about 10 years, which is a completely leftist organization. Uh, my father, uh, at one point of time, uh, uh, my grandmother's picture was on the house. And uh, my father would take away a photograph and put the photograph of Zubash Chandra Bose. So that's the sort of person he was. He was a nationalist. Kimi was his uh, great thing. So I was brought up that way. And uh, four years, I didn't even know what was happening, and what had happened during that time. But of course, there was a lot of respect, and uh, there were people who were, there were servants, and so that, a little bit of that continued. But more than that, it was a culture of literature, music, 
and uh, poetry. Well, unfortunately, uh, though I am uh, descended from great artistry, I am not able to. I have not able to uh, paint or draw anything. But I take uh, consolation from the fact from the fact that Rabindranath Tagore started uh, painting when he was about his game. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there an artist in the making? Is that what you're saying? Yes, there is. I will try. I have tried everything else actually, so I will try that as well. And um, more than anything else, in the temple, that's where all the ceremony and so when I go to the temple, it's a completely different thing. I mean, I'm taken there. That's when I realize that there is some, something different about belonging to such family. Otherwise, it's just the music, Swadhyadna, Ravi Varma, his art, the poetry by uh, uh, Kerala Kalidasa. So all that is what I'm proud to belong to. So there is tradition on one side, and there is the uh, the uh, the royalty on the other side. And uh, but you grew up in in Madras in Chennai. Uh, how, what kind of influences in the early stage uh, kind of directed you to, towards who you are today? I guess I was uh, pretty lonely in the beginning because I was the only uh, my, my sister was there, but I was we were just two of us. And uh, there was a lot of uh, walking along, and I lived in Nungabakum, I would have walked a lot and talked a lot. That's when I started writing. So this... So uh, how early was that, when you... When you oh, oh. Maybe when I was about... Uh, uh, my first short story was published in a magazine called uh, Adam and Eve, which I don't know if uh, anybody's heard of. Uh, uh, um, it was edited by Anjali Sarkar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was my first short, short story which was published in I was assuming about uh, 15 or so. Okay. okay. And what led you? Let's talk a little bit about that. What 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 led you to first, uh, I'm sure you must have put physically pen to paper at that time. Uh, and what led you to uh, A, write, B, uh, actually consider it worthy of sending to, uh, uh, to a publication requesting them to carry it? I was a storyteller. Uh, I, there are old uh, home movies where I'm a boy of three or four, sort of walk around, walking around, sort of uh, telling stories to my parents and other people. And I think they must have got bored and sent me to school. <laughs> <laughs> afterwards, I started writing and because I think that the influence was my father has published. He has uh, written three books. He has translated the uh, uh, Tulsi Das Ramayana into Malayalam. Okay. He has translated the uh, Hanuman Chali side to Malayalam. Okay. So that was a literary uh, uh, influence on the Malayalam part of it. And the English part of it, my mother also has been has published quite a lot. So that, that was always there. So it, I, I didn't have to sort of you know, look outside to So you were quite uh, uh, clear that you wanted to be a writer. Is that how, how the uh, journey kind of evolved? Yes, yes, because of stories. And movies side influence me a lot. So, uh, Are you a compulsive movie watcher? Uh, I can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is sitting there. <laughs> how, how much of clarity do you think, or when did you get the clarity, let me ask this question this way, that writing can be a career? Uh, writing short stories, sending them to a publication for uh, uh, for uh, you know, for submission uh, and hope, hoping that they will publish it is one thing. But to start thinking of an opportunity space called writing as a full-time uh, vocation or even a calling, uh, how did that happen? Was was there was it during college or was it much later? Um, no, I was. Uh, I did a lot of things while writing. So it was only much later, maybe towards the end of 2000, that I. Stopped everything else and devoted myself just to writing. But otherwise, um, I actually uh, enrolled at the law college and I was there for about, uh, about half a year or something. But there was a strike there, fortunately. And uh, so I. Uh, <laughs> this was in Kerala? In Madras. Uh, uh, okay. So, because for 40, uh, I think about 40 years I've called it Madras. Now this, I need an equal number of. <laughs> yes, to <laughs> So um, uh, then my mother said, why don't you, uh, this, there's this advertisement, and so I saw that and I applied and I got a job with Indian Express. 
So there, from there onwards, it was different because you are uh, you're already writing. And uh, I used to do this, uh, I used to uh, watch films and interview the directors. Uh, so I, I started out with some great people like uh, Adur and uh, uh, John Abraham. So that, uh, I, I don't know if you uh, realize that journalism is a fantastic stepping stone to fiction, writing fiction, because you observe, you take in details, you immerse yourself in a certain other life, and then all that helps you in creating characters, even in a play, characters, and making something live. Uh, there was a movement once upon a time in the, during the 60s called the New Journalism, where journalists uh, wrote, uh, reported like fiction. And uh, strangely enough, at the same time, fiction writers uh, started writing uh, realistic stuff, any realistic stuff, as though it's actually happened. And uh, that influenced me a lot, that interested me a lot. So that that time, so you uh, you were working with Indian Express at that time, right? So we, we'll go to that uh, uh, in, in a moment, but I had a question which came up from something that you just said. You said you were doing multiple things and it was only after 2000 that you uh, decided to devote yourself full time to writing. So, uh, what were those multiple things that you were doing? Uh, I mean, I always had this question for you, never asked it so far. Uh, you, to me, I to, you have you've not done any of the things that royalty would normally do. Like you've not had a stud farm. Uh, you, 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 you've not had you've not had racing cars, or you don't own a cricket team. Okay, uh, so you've not done those things. So, what were the multiple things that you were doing, and why did you not typically do things like, let's say, real estate, or you know? Uh, stuff like that. What what kept you drawing you back into the world because of it's uh, stuff? <laughs> <laughs> you think uh, uh, no? Uh, I was I wanted to get into something on those lines, but uh, not the start farm. <laughs> <laughs> what I have been doing, you know. Uh, so when I came back, uh, we started a printing press, and uh, even though we were publishing brochures and designing brochures and things like that, I was also editing. Uh, Magazines for Bushwo, Callan, and LNT. The and corporate magazines. The corporate magazines. And then we started a magazine. Ita and I started a magazine called Tried It. I remember Tried It, yeah. So uh, a lot of people have used that as a springboard, and uh, CP Surendran, the poet, Arish Vijur, the management person. A lot of people have started from uh, Tried It. And that was an exciting time. And I remember when I started. Uh, tried it and there was a minister, health minister called H.P. Hamke. So I had sent somebody to interview him. And he called me back and talked to me on the phone for about one hour and to discourage me from uh, starting a magazine. <laughs> and the perils of you know, investing and uh, doing this sort of thing. And the final issue when I realized that we could not uh, go on and uh, carry on uh, with the magazine, that had an interview with Jairalita, it had an interview with Maneka Gandhi, it had a cover of uh, uh, Indira Gandhi. It was, uh, and that was uh, not uh, letter press, but uh, uh, the other thing, was that? Uh, offset. Offset, offset printing. And then I realized that we could not carry, it, carry on any longer, and that thing was shelved. So we, uh, ended with a grand sort of gesture which the world never saw. <coughs> so, I, I'll come back to your writing part now. What is What was more powerful in writing that you saw uh, that uh, led you to like shut down something like Trident, which is a magazine that with some more effort you could have, uh, you know, you could have, you could have continued publishing. No? That was not the thing. We can start off with Start Farm, we can do anything, but uh, adding a magazine is something very difficult. So financially we were not. So I had a budget, we, we knew where we should stop. So that's the thing. It's not because we lost interest, uh, I was more interested in writing. Because we had this whole group coming along with us. We couldn't let them down by closing it arbitrarily. We had problems, financial problems. 
and uh, those days it was difficult because uh, so it was a prudent business decision to yes. to not to yes. not go with a case which uh, which which was not uh, financially viable. Yes, right. Yes. So that's the. Uh, then we started a publishing unit. Then we started computer trading and. Hans uh, was involved with a mm -hmm. uh, project that Eva and I, like Eva was more than me, because she was the, uh, the, the soul I told you, the, the everything behind that. And then I also was teaching. Um, so he taught at uh, the Chennai Mathematical Institute. That was afterwards. That was afterwards. But he has a very, very strong profile as a teacher. He's, he's taught uh, for 13 years, you've taught creative English at the Chennai Mathematical Institute, and you also taught at the Madras Christian College where you actually went, did your MA and MPhil, yes. and you uh, you taught uh, English literature and journalism, yes. right? So, yeah, so continue. So you, you were saying you were... You were so thinking, my right? problem was that I couldn't face a crowd, an audience. I couldn't <laughs> imagine uh, sitting where the master used to sit, and sort of his entire body of students uh, looking at me like you are now. So I went for this interview uh, because uh, one of uh, my one of my <coughs> here, my juniors, Srina, the famous, uh, the famous famous, uh, he, not uh, Srina, but this uh, 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 professor uh, G K Matthew was resigning, and he uh, called up and said, um, uh, there, "There will be a slot for a year. Why don't you fill it?" So I said, fine, because I didn't really think about it. But when I applied and I got it, uh, Gita will vouch for this. I almost got it. I contemplated suicide. Seriously, I couldn't. It was a terrible thing to happen, to sit there and... But my first class, uh, fortunately, was an essay. Uh, I had to take an essay by Winston Churchill, uh, in which he said, even after his 250th talk, he had butterflies in his stomach whenever he uh, entered a room full of uh, people. So I thought if he could have that and get away with it, I could. <laughs> That's how you motivated yourself. Yes. yes. That was, and apparently, I was also at the Rotary Club. And uh, when they used to ask me to do the vote of thanks, the entire meeting would be spoiled. That's how it began. But then, being uh, you know, uh, office bearer, being a president of the club, that, that sort of gave me enough. So these things sort of you know fed off each other, mm -hmm. uh, college uh, teaching. And another thing is when I uh, lectured students, sometimes I feel I got much more out of them than you know, I could give. That's interesting, yeah. That, that often happens, yes. And uh, the literature students are not as exciting as uh, science students to teach uh, creative English. So I found those 13 years in the Chennai Mathematical Institute uh, more challenging, more refreshing, and it gave me much more than I could have. Journalism, of course, it was, I mean, uh, 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 what I had uh, experienced in journalism. Right? There are a few funny things that which happened in the course of journalism in Indian Express. If we have time after that with the clock. It allows you later on. I, I want to. Uh, I, I specifically have a question on your Indian Express years, but uh, just for the sake of the audience, I, I want a. I want to ask you a question, which kind of connects these many things that you've just shared with us. So it appears that although you were born in a royal family, uh, the culture was one of literature, poetry, music, and the arts, and uh, you had this phase of early life when you were, uh, you know, you, you dealt with your loneliness in such a way that you could express yourself through the written word and you started writing. And in a way, uh, you entered the journalism space and worked with the Indian Express. And also, whatever business that you tried to launch was in the publishing space, right? So you did multiple things, uh, all of them connecting back with writing in some way, yes. with the written word in some way. Is that when you reflect back on, on, on all of that, do you see a pattern? Do you see uh, any reason why you uh, 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 were able to uh, stay in that same zone and not stray from it? I have been phenomenally <coughs> lucky because things have happened to me, and things have happened to me which moved me from, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
a moment of doubt to a moment of great uh, sort of satisfaction, even without confidence, as much confidence. But I, I was able to reach a, these things happened to me. There was sort of serendipitous things. Is that how it's pronounced? Serendipitous. You're saying it right. Yeah. Uh, that. So, uh, for example. Uh, so, was there a moment, since you're talking about lack of confidence, was there a moment when you. No, I said uh, not lack of confidence, but it's not because of confidence, but it was something which took me from. Uh, Did you at any point uh, even think that you don't want to be in the writing space? You don't want to be a writer? Never. Never. So that didn't occur. That, that, that didn't occur. Okay. So, uh, I'd like to, uh, I'll tell you another uh, sort of uh, happy thing which happened to me. There was this uh, the British Council uh, a competition for short plays, I, I think one act plays. And uh, I didn't, I've never ever written a play. I had acted in one, I had directed a play in college. But I had never ever uh, sort of written one. Uh, maybe a uh, skits. And I wrote this uh, play and it got me the second prize. That is the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord. After that, for 10 years, I did nothing. Mm -hmm. And then there was this uh, Hindu and uh, Madras players. Uh, uh, another, it was in All India. That was the Bow of Ram. Uh, so that got the first prize. And then I had this fabulous person, this theatre person, this mentor who came and told me, whatever you write, you give it to me first. I don't think any playwright would have the luxury of having somebody who is a veteran in theatre coming forward and telling him, whatever you write, give it to me first. So that gave you the confidence? That to, gave me the confidence. To pursue? Yes, and you made an inspired choice when you uh, selected your second speaker for the series. <laughs> he was the, my mentor. So, um, uh, the third one, again, there was a gap of 10 years. I don't know what this was with the 10 years. But uh, 10 years... Uh, but you've done 11 plays, totally. Or was, uh, so most of it was grounded towards the... Okay. Uh, sort of so, it came much later. Yeah, and smaller plays, short plays. Okay. Um, so, then uh, Madras Players was uh, celebrating uh, its 50th year. And uh, I'm also as old as Madras players. So I thought <laughs> that it was a happy thing that they asked me to do this play to start off which that is, year. Which is platform. Which is platform. Which is done by Yamuna, which had a uh, strange idea. I wanted, uh, when you're traveling by train and uh, you look out at the platform, you see many groups of people and you see familiar faces of strangers. And you wonder what they're doing there and what they're discussing and what's going on over there. So this play uh, is about, uh, it's about uh, four acts, I think, uh, four uh, uh, scenes. And each one of, uh, act, uh, scene number one has a group of actors, scene number three have the same actors. So they are familiar looking people doing different things. Um, and finally, I mean, you slowly get to, I mean, you have opposites. The same, the same uh, Bhagyan, which was one of Bhagyan's finest performances, because she did two different uh, uh, diametrically opposite roles in uh, this play. So that is something which I want to do. I always sort of experiment with what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, like Agatha Christie is a, uh, Great favorite, inspiration. Favorite, uh, favorite author uh, from uh, sort of handed down from my mother. So uh, when Midnight Hotel came in, I wanted a thriller with a ghost because I was always fascinated by ghosts, <laughs> and magic was also something which I was fascinated by. And, and uh, you, you have done magic, you have learned magic. Or I was fascinated. In Hebrew times, there was a bookshop where from where I used to buy books on magic and read them. And then I would try all sorts of tricks, some worked, some didn't. And I noticed uh, that therefore magic uh, and, and, the, and the surreal come uh, more, than, more than a few times in your works. Yes, uh, right? children's books I can do that right. safely. Right. 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 The, others, the magic store of uh, no, no charm. charm, no charm yes. Yes. So yes. you've done that, you've done that even in um, uh, the uh, Devil's, um, Devil's Garden. Devil's Garden. And also okay. one in uh, 
play in which uh, the Bala Vidya Mandir uh, did. Which uh, KK directed that. Which K, uh, it was not KK, he was he supervised. supervised. Uh, uh, called uh, Dantu's Dream. Dantu's Dream, right. There was a lot of song and dance also. Yes, yes, yes. And so, I wrote the songs and that was fabulous. I wish somebody would give me. <laughs> I always look at Ram and I say such things. He gave me a music and with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, songs. So, um, I, I want to come to the writing process. I think I'm very curious to know how you write and how you transcend so many genres at the same time, you know. Um, but I want to go to a phase which could have tempted you to do something very different. And the question therefore is why didn't you do it? Uh, so I understand that when you were with the Indian Express as a journalist and later with Cinema Today as a, as a film journalist writing films and you uh, were reviewing films. So you were Utna, Baitna, everything was with the uh, film community. And you had friends like Amjad Khan and Devanand who, Devanand who offered you a uh, uh, to join this political party, uh, and, and uh, Amjad Khan read out uh, Shairi's to you. I know, not read out. He was driving the car. He was so proud of the new Mercedes Benz that he had. So we were there uh, with him, and uh, Agha was also one of the passengers in the car. And uh, he was he was spouting Shairi. Oh, like uh, like it was had, going through him. Yes, and I didn't know that he was a poet. And also he had. Uh, I think wicked sense of humor, delicious but wicked sense of humor. <laughs> so there was Raj Kapoor, there was Dilip Kumar, and, the, and you were connecting with all these people, and you were a writer. So I have a very simple question: How come you you haven't ventured into that space of screenwriting, uh, a? And why did you move back from Mumbai, where uh, screenwriting could have been such a thriving business uh, and opportunity? Why did you c come back to Madras, you know? Must remember, this is this was in the 80s. I have it was the not even uh, I, we had just entered the 80s, so it wasn't like uh, I mean it is now. You know, it wasn't a very welcome sort of place. Which is um, Mumbai or films? Mumbai. Okay. And films, I wanted to, but I could have I would have just gone and on and on and on because I've seen people struggling there. I've seen all sorts of people struggling there. I have. Um, seen a lot of frustration, a lot of despair. And here there was something which was waiting for me, uh, this press. And the printing press was, I don't know if I should talk about a little incident which happened. Please, uh, please if, 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 you, if, if uh, it, it's coming uh, to you, please uh, uh, Another mischievous person in our family was my father's elder brother. So he knew that I was uh, right, uh, I was interested in writing. Mm -hmm. and So that day the Hindu, I had seen a small advertisement for a uh, printing press for children which is made of rubber and it sort of must have been so, so big. So I wanted to buy that. And I uh, told my uncle and he said, uh, I'll tell your father and we all got into the car and we went to this place. So I thought it was a shop where you can get this. I didn't realize he had taken me to a place next to Higgin Bhagavad's called Associated Printers. And my father uh, thought it was a, some small, uh, I mean, you could get things like that. So he asked him, uh, there was a man at the desk and he said, so um, uh, how much would be a small, simple uh, press call, uh, I mean, uh, press cost? So he said it would cost about uh, 15. <laughs> so I had about uh, 20 paise in my mind, <laughs> 50 rupees or something that I could not spawn at least. Purse, which I had collected over the months. So I said, I have, I have. <laughs> and then he said, where is the press? And he showed me one of those huge <laughs> monsters. And said, this is the press, 15 lakhs. <laughs> but I told you, I think enormously lucky. From that moment, <laughs> After Bombay, I came back to Madras and we started to print this. <laughs> so was, was that incident, in a way, uh, a motivation for you to want to come back and set it up? Is that what you know, it was always there. I wanted to start. I used to, I had done my own uh, uh, magazine once upon a time. It was a handwritten magazine. And I used to type it out when I had it. I but I wanted to have something printed in my hand. 
and uh, that was and that drew you that drew me to a lot of things like uh, fiction like uh, uh, holding my own book in my hand but of all these things i should tell you that the most this the satisfaction i get as a writer and the immediate satisfaction is um, when you sit in an auditorium and watch your characters on stage speaking your lines i think that that satisfaction is something which i don't think even a novel writing a novel and holding the book in your hand can even though it is appropriated by other people even though that is the least of your own work because there's a director there are actors there are like men there are music uh, there are people all sorts of people are involved in your work but that is where you get the most satisfaction because you know immediately whether something works or not fantastic uh, i i want to just say uh, share what i am picking up here i think if you look at the story so far it's always been coming back to expressing himself as a writer in whatever he has done uh, and in in a very uh, strange way he's made these choices uh, against what could have been more tempting choices right uh, I, I, whether it is getting into a line of business that people uh, with uh, with, a, with a lot of support and backing may want to get in or uh, in your uh, in your case where you were uh, in mumbai with the filmy crowd with the industry people and you could have ventured into that space but you came back to express yourself as a, as a writer in the purest sense and now you're talking about uh, writing uh, the, the joy being higher when uh, you're seeing your work being produced and staged on uh, uh, you know by 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 theater groups so as a playwright that gives you a greater joy so uh, let's talk a little bit about your writing process itself to me uh, and i'll quote from one of his your poems i think your poem is uh, titled let me if i if i'm if i'm not correct me if my uh, memory is um, playing hard here so let me there is a line which says the world of a writer isn't by words isn't filled by words but by the silence of words and I, you know when i read that it, it, it connected immediately so the world of right writer isn't filled by words but the silence of words so writing is such a solitary process right i think in every other art form there can be a collaborative experience uh, but right writing like painting is a very solitary process right uh, how do you keep yourself motivated uh, when you write uh, and uh, what happens when you you try out you know you you feel uh, completely lost uh, Uh, and are not able to proceed. Let's say you know people famously call it the writer's block, uh, but there are times when you hit a dead end, a creative dead end. How do you deal with this? How do you deal with the the loneliness of writing and with dead ends when you sometimes come up against them? Uh, basically, there are four kinds of writing that I have been doing. One is poetry, which doesn't figure in this question. Um, when I'm writing a novel, that's when uh, I sort of. most like and most likely to get a writer's block so then i write up so you do get one yes i write a play okay <laughs> you switch the genre in three of my plays when i told him uh i think uh platform uh, when i told him cast party at another play happened when there was a writer's block when i was writing <laughs> because you are going into a completely different thing altogether and but for a play it flows afterwards i have to blow a lot of rewriting and but getting back to it but the play almost sort of takes me from the beginning to the end so let's say you have you are you working on a novel you actually stop work and start work on a play yes yeah, sometimes i do both in <laughs> parallel process both yeah, sometimes i do because it's a different uh, stage on all together and then i have a deadline for a um uh, uh, for a uh, uh, review or a cover story or something like that so that that also i do but it's because writing sort of gives you a thrill which or a, or a you know a, it's what you are writing at the moment works if it works then you can uh, uh, have parallel sort of things going on 
If it doesn't work, you push, put it, put it aside, and then you go uh, concentrate on that. So what you're saying is, if 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 you hit a uh, block, don't don't keep at it. Step back. That's what you're saying. Yes, because you have to maintain a distance, keep away from it. Otherwise, you tend to think that it's going to be terrible. You lose faith in yourself. You lose faith in what you're writing. There's a uh, sort of depression. I don't know if you. Uh, it's, it's a sort of depression that you uh, get into because your work is not. And for me, uh, when I write, Gita knows. Uh, sometimes, because uh, in Maria's room uh, was a, uh, you know, it had a certain. It's a murder mystery, right? It's not a murder mystery. It is a psychological sort of thing, and it's a Goa which is not the sunny, bright Goa which we are used to, but a rainy. Uh, you know, yeah, it's set in the monsoon and go on. Thing. And there is a, uh, a back story of a Frenchman and uh, this girl. So there is the story of the writer, Raja Prasad, who, yes. who, who, goes, who goes to Goa to write a second novel. Yes. So uh, I had a related question on Maria's room. Uh, was, was, in a sense, was it autobiographical? Are you that, uh, are you that uh, writer who goes there to write uh, <laughs> the second novel? Is that, is that how the inspiration happened? Uh, after I finished my first novel, we had gone to Goa, and um, there was this temple there called uh, Temple Mahalisa, and uh, they said that it, this Mahalisa is actually a Mohini. So my first novel was called Eleven to Mohini. Mohini. So I said I bring the a copy of the book next time I come there and uh, give it to them. So I came back again. Uh, it was a rainy. Uh, sort of uh, two days, very, very stormy. And uh, so we got on from the train and we hired a taxi and uh, the car wouldn't go for the because of the water. We got into a bigger vehicle and both of us were sitting there. And then suddenly we realized there was this couple at the back. We had even noticed them. So I had, I was going there to write a book set in Kerala. Okay. But the moment this happened, the entire thing changed. And that's how Maria's group begins. Okay. So the, everything came in uh, over there, and I started writing this thing. But what I was saying is, uh, I get, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I get sort of, uh, I don't know if you can say, possessed by my novels. But she knows uh, each time I write something like that, it, it, it affects me a lot. For during those few days, then I'm back to my old novel. When you say you were affected, are you affected by the characters? Or, or the the mood, the setting. I'm part of. I become part of that. It's it's very strange, but I I sort of uh, live some of those moments. And how are you able to switch between the the, the genres? When when you are when you are in the in the space of creating. No, one. that's that's when there is a writer's block. Okay. See that I, I if I go in any further, it's it, it's going to be disastrous. I know that. So that's when I would want to go into a complete different. If I don't write at all, then I wouldn't be able to get back into this writing. So uh, writing uh, different types of things sort of helps me, helps me sort of you know uh, keep myself anchored. That's uh, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm I'm still in amazement of the fact that you can write poetry, you can write novels, you can write children's books, you can write uh, stage plays. And uh, you can, at the same time, also process a, uh, a typical media report, which has to be filed. It could be a review or it could be a cover story, as you said. And you can switch these 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 genres very, very easily. Uh, actually, a lot of people can do that. I know one little girl who can do that. Who's sitting there? Uh, that she writes fiction. She writes uh, plays. She writes. Uh, so you don't you don't think too much about it. No, I mean, if you're happy with what you're writing, I was coming to that. Good, go on. If happy with what you're writing, I think everything works. And I, I have this thing which I tell, used to tell my students, that uh, we are all like a sort of a violin. And as we sort of you draw the string down, those, I mean, draw the bow down the strings, uh, you produce different sounds, different pitches. And we've all got it in us. Music, uh, everything that we, uh, you know, we can, we don't do. 
if we just think about it, what we are capable of, it's just that lack of courage of trying. That's what keeps us. So I, I just wanted to explore, experiment, maybe, and stumble and come back and see if we could make something out of it. This is, he's, you know, he's being his modest self, but I think what we are picking up, what I'm picking up here, is that if you're happy doing what you're doing, then you can do many things. And there's a lot of talent within us who are waiting to be expressed. And he's, you know, the, the, the metaphor of the violin really is uh, about being able to produce different kinds of work uh, within the same space. And that's, uh, you know, you're just being modest that anybody can do it, I'm sure. But I think very few people apply themselves. So do you have a writer's discipline? Uh, do you have, uh, do you have like, I have to do X number of words this week? Uh, and uh, do you work like that, or do you go with the flow of it? I used to. Now, in the past maybe one year, I've just been going through old uh, sort of work. Yeah. But I, I used to do that. I used to sit there because that's the only way you can function. You think about it, you create, you let it, uh, you know, imagination produce whatever it's producing within you all the time. I again talk about this electricity. It's all flowing all the time, but when you put on the switch, it comes on. So uh, when you're sitting there, that's when you're, you're prepared for it. That's when you write. But it's all all the time. Even when I'm looking at you now, there could be another novel. Wow. And yeah. what would you call it? <laughs> yeah. uh, talking about names, I, I'm very intrigued by some of the things that you come up with. Like, you know, where do you go and find a name like No Cham Wu, the magic store of No Cham Wu? Of course, it's a children's uh, uh, you know book, but how do you come up with a name like that? Uh, how and and uh, you know you you also like um, um, uh, you know uh, Gabo a lot, right? I mean, you like him as a writer, right? Uh, and uh, uh, Gabriel Gar uh, Garcia Marquez, uh, you like him a lot. And there's a lot of magic realism that uh, his work contained, and your work. Uh, does it borrow on, on, on some of that? Is, is there an inspiration element there? No, basically it is the, uh, it's that you can go to places where uh, people don't normally go. I'm talking with the writer. Um, you, you, you are scared of stepping away from the accepted popular format template that uh, People normally write. You, you have a so what kind of a book is it? If you can't explain it, I think that's what you should do. And that's how you uh, you choose your subjects. Is that there is no choosing. Huh. It happens. I I, I have an uh, uh, an idea, and it, uh, I decide whether it should be a play or a, a novel. And if it stays with me long enough, if it uh, you know sees another world, another time then uh, it's a novel. And I stay with it. In fact, I have one completed novel which I'm still working on. I, ready? I'm ready. ready, but I'm still working on it. I, I heard that your first first ever novel remains unpublished. Is that, is I, a, I was only about uh, 16 or 17, and my only reader was my, my listener was my grandmother. <laughs> she had, uh, it's a, a really, uh, it reflects very badly on me, but uh, she had ruled the kingdom once upon a time. And then I had subjected her to this torture of you know, She was this, in this room lying down in a bed and she couldn't move. And I went there and started reading out my novel. So maybe that's why it, uh, it was never published. <laughs> it was called the, uh, Knife, the Knives of Nama. It was set in, uh, it was set in Egypt. It is a mystery, a murder mystery. And it still remains unpublished till today? Yes, it's in three books which I am trying to locate even now. Mm -hmm. handle. Okay. okay. Oh, you don't, you, you don't have access to the manuscript? Uh, uh, I, it's somewhere at home. And the uh, <laughs> terrible thing uh, about uh, when I stopped reading to her was uh, I used to uh, look at the encyclopedia and all that. You didn't have Google those things. So I used to look at the encyclopedia and do my little research. And there was this one of the murders was this uh, in administration of a, uh, a medicine called uh, Salvarsan. 
I didn't know it was uh, uh, medicine for uh, syphilis. <laughs> so my grandmother said, what? <laughs> why did he say, uh, why did he take salvarsin? He said, I don't know, it sounded very exotic. <laughs> Then I stopped reading <laughs> Does it matter? Does it matter to you that your work uh, uh, must be published and must be read? Uh, what I'm asking is, are there regrets that your uh, you, some of your work can get published? Uh, so is is the process of writing important, or is the process of publishing seeing it come? Uh, get in the hands of a reader, or in the case of a play, coming alive on stage, that is more important. What's more important from your point of view? Writing it is absolutely a fabulous sort of uh, time that I spent with myself and creating on that. But suddenly when I hear some reader talking to me about some character, some moment, I went to a girls' college, Meenakshi College, and I had a uh, girls talking to them and suddenly this girl gets up and says, why did you have to kill that uncle? <laughs> so when, uh, when people get so involved with the characters and they sort of question me, I think I think, and, and um, uh, in England, somebody from somewhere whom I didn't even know could uh, get their hands on this book, asks me questions about uh, my work at I and uh, summon them and things like that in narrative body. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's uh, the, the, the reception, uh, reception the, the, uh, the reaction, the response. They, it's very immediate, it's there. But uh, this you get suddenly, or I mean, you, you find out sometimes from the internet, you suddenly see two people talking about your book. So that gives me great happiness. That something which I've created, the world which I've created, somebody else is sort of enjoying and talking about it. So while while you welcome the uh, the uh, the uh, attention that that your work gets, uh, it's the the greater joy lies in creating it. That's what I'm hearing you say. There are two there are two different things. This you make it happen. You make it happen. The other thing happens as a sort of byproduct. <coughs> you are happy that it happens. So there's great great joy in the process for you. There's great joy in the process. Uh, Parshi Raja is a, is a, is a par, Parshi Raja. Parshi Raja. Raja is a uh, is a historical book uh, for children. Uh, it has a lot of history, and you uh, you know talked about a lot of research that went into it. Um, how come you never uh, wrote a book on the Travancore royal family itself, which is steeped in history and so much of richness of heritage uh, and something that's very close to your heart? Uh, but you haven't ventured in that space at all. Or have you and you have not talked no, about it? No, actually my grandmother wanted me to write about the time when the family <coughs> left Charakil in the north and came down to uh, Travancore and uh, that sort of time and all that. But at that time it was too big a thing for me. And then there was a moment when they wanted me to write a book on Ravi Verma because I was privy to all the the personal, the private things, and those are not the womanizing things that these films talk about, which is terrible. Mm -hmm. Just imagine if they talk about your grandfather and say it was a womanizer. Would you be happy? <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, uh, so uh, he was a great man. He was a poet. He was a spiritual person. He, uh, uh, there was so much more to him. And I wanted to write that book to get away from this, get people away from this impression. And I have still this letter from David Davila saying, Dear Sri Kumar, I'm still waiting for the book and we are happy to be able to publish. I couldn't. I thought it was too big for me. I thought, I mean, it, you, still it believe, you still believe so? so? So the project has never been worked on? It's because I'm lazy. <laughs> a lazy person can write fiction, but a strong person uh, who's, uh, you know, an activist can write something like that. But Parashi Raja also, uh, I found that there was this uh, either a lot of adulatory stuff about it plays uh, making uh, to be a big uh, mythical person, and uh, the other side of him, which is uh, the the British version of him as a bandit and things like that. So I had to find out what he really was, 
and he was not a six footer. And he, he, he was a small man, a powerful man, a man who could sort of could defend his uh, people against the British. So I, I went to Parashi, I interviewed some of the uh, relatives because they are related to my wife. Uh, package, a uh, friend of mine, a uh, very close friend of mine called Sukumar Nagyar. He had sent me uh, a lot of Xerox copies of uh, uh, this uh, Logan's manual. So that was a great help to me and I created, I, I had I've seen the place where it was killed and I went there and saw all that. So research is a very integral part of your uh, that book. Uh, that book. That book but uh, how, uh, <coughs> something like, let's say, Lament of Mohini uh, came, perhaps could have come from the fact that in your own family, you oh, also, you know, I was also, I was talking about two families. One yeah. is uh, 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 the royal family, which uh, so many people had spoken to me, and I, I, I knew. I mean, I've been hearing these stories. But the other thing was the number three family. So I but you talk about five generations. Five, five generations, right? So, so you talk about certain times which are inaccessible now. So my question was, when you have to do research, like you said, you had to, you went to Goa, and so you actually went to Goa in a monsoon time. Right? No, actually, uh, I did speak to Abraham Rali. I asked him, uh, what do I do if I want to get something from history? So he said, is it fiction? I said, it's fiction. He said, forget history. So I just had the basics, and then I worked on those basics and created the, the story. That, that was a bad story. Mm -hmm. But for this uh, Lamitu Pohini, I read uh, 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 memoirs of a Nabudri uh, scholar okay. in Madera. So there is, there is some back, back work that goes in. I know. Now I am a little lazy. <laughs> and only now I could have written those two books. But now I am... Do you read? To uh, to keep uh, to keep yourself creatively inspired, do you read other people's works? Actually, I because of my reviews, they keep sending me books. They ask me, uh, can I send you this book? I say no. Hmm. Can I send you this book? I say yes. Because okay. I always I have a book with me, okay, which is for a review. Okay. And because of the first review that my book received, I never ever sort of uh, I'm never vindictive or I never. You know, uh, 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 use sarcasm or bad humor on uh, such writers. I don't know this. I could have asked you to review my book when it was published. <laughs> no, everyone's been charitable to me, but uh, you know, it would have still been a privilege to have you review my book. But thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a very, very important question, which is, and this is, uh, this is a question that you can choose to answer any which way you like. So you come from a very illustrious background and you, you tried your hand at a couple of businesses and you talked about financial trouble and uh, therefore uh, winding up the business before, before things went out of hand. Unlike in my case where I, I, I went the whole hog and burnt all my fingers. Uh, so my question is, when you are in that state where you have to uh, have a, a, a financially sound perspective of life uh, and you embrace writing and you have embraced writing and you, you're at that critical point where you can continue to put more businesses on the table. Uh, you actually take a choice, make, a, make an informed decision to uh, plunge deep dive into the uh, writing, which is that 2000. Uh, around 2000, you said you stopped doing everything else and focused only on writing. Uh, how does this? How did it come about? How did this decision come about when uh, writing is, is not exactly the most lucrative uh, lines of work, right? Uh, financially, it takes a long time to, uh, to to become very viable and very very prolific with your uh, royalties coming in and all of that. So, how did that choice happen? Uh, saying, let's what stop royalties? Hmm? What <laughs> royalties? <laughs> That's it, right? The royalties from book sales. I think the <laughs> <laughs> I got seven, seven and a half percent. <laughs> so, how did that decision happen? Uh, how did you, how were you so convinced that I can take this uh, decision now? You know, for one thing, uh, for quitting, the other thing was because Gita was doing a lot of work which I was having while I was uh, writing. Gita was taking the brunt of it. 
So that was, after some time, it became a little uh, uneasy. I mean, I didn't want to put her into all this sort of thing. So that, that decision was made. Then she was also teaching that I decided to. Uh, uh, then there, there was a very interesting thing that uh, we wanted to take our entire thing to Bahrain. There was somebody interested. So we, uh, uh, an entire, you know, public, uh, uh, this uh, training career, personality building, and all sorts of computer training, and an entire thing which I was, uh, we wanted to start in Bahrain. So it started out very well. The idea was very uh, thing, and we, uh, interviewed people and we got them all right and, and then they said there is a certain period during Ramza now afterwards when nothing works. I said come on, something or the other will work but actually nothing worked. So at that point of time my father was not well and the doctor said you have to remain here. 